unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language. But the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Who is ready to worship God with me? Praise the Lord Jesus. Alright, just raise your hands and worship Him. Worship Him. Worship Him. Just worship. Speak in other tongues. Speak in other tongues. The praise of God is here. He's about to do mighty things today. He's about to do mighty things today. Shile baras. Kosheke rebara. Robo seke leba. Shile barra reba sakatala. Shile barra kasakara raba. Speak in other tongues. Ma shile barra seke leba. Robo seke leba rarara. Reba kasakara rarara. Robo bu 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 seke leba. Rasete leba. Ore kayande lebo kosikala. Mare prosikaya. Risa kayaba. Stand amazed in your presence. There is nothing that you cannot do. Stand amazed in your presence. There is joy, peace, and hope. Again, I stand amazed. I stand amazed in your presence. Oh, there is nothing you cannot do. Hey, I stand amazed. I stand
speaking out of time.
in Fanero, or oh, now we've been here for more than a year, right? A year? And how many months? Two months? Yeah, one year and two months. And now I felt that it's time to teach some of these things. Hallelujah. Because when you're dealing with a church, or a people, a group of people, you know at what stages everyone is. Is that? And so sometimes you know, huh? 
They might not be able to handle some of these things. But as they continue to grow, then you say, oh, okay, now we can handle, we can handle. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Today, I'm not going to so much delve in the principles than just the mind of the Spirit pertaining these things because I've shared these principles in a sermon, a sermon series of mine called Secrets of Divine Providence. There is a, it's a five part series CD. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. It teaches from the beginning. Hallelujah. It, whatever you want to know about success, prosperity, financially, praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Because we're tired of poor people. And we're tired of manipulating people and manipulated people. You get my point. You understand? Yet the Bible is very clear about these things. Hallelujah. You'll be so surprised when I start to share that there are things that people uh, think or they, uh, they know or understand, but sometimes you're so shocked that some people don't understand these things. Hallelujah. So a certain approach I'm going to take today, but with the principles, those of you who have debates and say, oh, maybe I don't believe in first fruit, you go and see my teaching get the scriptures and compare the notes and reconcile records. So some people say, ah, me, I'm a grace minister, I don't believe in tithes anymore. Okay, go to the scriptures and see. Some people say, ah, you know, I'll, I'll share a few of that. But most importantly, it's important that if you are interested, praise the Lord Jesus Christ, in not living a poor life, eh, it's important you invest in knowledge. Hallelujah. First say these words upon your life. Say, I'm rich. I'm rich. I am blessed. By the blessing of Almighty God. In Jesus' mighty name. I wax great on every side. In Jesus' mighty name. I carry the blessing of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I carry a blessing that addeth no sorrow. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Say Amen. Hallelujah. Let me explain to us the real problem. Hallelujah. Matthew chapter 6 verse 19. Ultimate question. Praise the Lord Jesus. Ultimate question. Matthew 6 verses 19. Hallelujah. This is an instruction, okay? It's not a request. Say amen. <clears throat> let's read. The Bible says, let's go. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon the earth where moth and rust does corrupt where thieves break through and steal give me the amplified uh-huh do not gather and heap up and store up for yourselves treasures on the earth where moth and rust and worm consume and destroy and where thieves break through and steal next verse it says, but gather and heap up and store yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust nor worm consume and destroy, where thieves do not break through to steal. Next verse. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Don't be deceived. Wherever you see a man's treasure is where his heart is. Hallelujah. Where you see a man's investments is where his heart is. Where you see a man's riches is where his heart is. Don't be deceived. Where your treasure is, your heart is. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You cannot say that I have a heart in God when you have not stored treasures in God. Are you with me? Are you with me? Because the Bible says that where your treasure is, and amplified, there your heart also will be. Hallelujah. Where your treasure is, your heart will be. So when you see that certain people don't, you know, store treasures spiritually, simply put, their heart is not there. Okay? But I'm going to go deeper. Don't worry. Next verse. The eye, I heard the Bible says, is a what? Is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is sound, your entire body will be full of light. Uh -huh. Now, I wanted something there. But if your eye isn't sound, your whole body will be full of darkness. Now here. 
If then, listen, the very light in you, your conscience, is darkened, how dense is that darkness? In other words, the conscience in a man is his light. Are you hearing me? But here is now the paradox of how the light in you is darkened. How the light in you is darkened. Let me give you a situation of a man in whom the light of him is darkened. The Bible says, okay, that this is eternal life, that they might know the one true God and his only son, Jesus. The other mystery of the eternal life in God is the spirit of truth. That means that everything we do has to be aligned to the spirit of truth. There are many things that are reasonably right, but are not true. There are many things that are reasonably articulate, but they are not true. There are many things that are reasonably factual, but they are not true. Are you hearing me? Sometimes Christians invest so much in what is reasonable. And the very spirit that seeks to establish reasonable above truth is the very spirit that bats the commandments and ideas of men even as the doctrine of Christ. There are things in God that are not reasonably right. They are not reasonable to a human being, but they are truth to God. Now, there are many people who can't reconcile that because of this one thing. That they have not yet abounded in the understanding of the love of the Father. Because when you understand the love of the Father, your conscience, the place in you which ought to have the light, cannot darken to judge his judgments. You understand? In a place where you reason out what he knows to be true, and you take it contrary to what is true, because it seems rightful to you and reasonably right. And that is why when you look at the ardent line of the true lines of offense in the real Christian faith in the book of Thessalonians, is a place where the Bible says that we have not abounded enough in love, in, love, in all knowledge and in all judgments for us to approve the things most excellent. And because we don't approve the things most excellent, the Bible says we cannot or we do have offense. Praise the Lord. He says, and this I pray. Now that's why he prays for the church. He says, and this I pray, that your love may abound. The love in your, of, of the Father may abound more and more in knowledge. You love in knowledge. You love in knowledge. He says that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment that you may approve the things that are excellent and that they, you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. In other words, that there is a place of offense where the Lord Jesus counts on us, the church, by reason of misunderstanding knowledge and judgment. Some people think that the true lines of offenses are primarily you lie to a brother, you did this, and all of that, yes, is sin. But how about the responsibility of a man understanding exactly how to deal with knowledge? Because the scriptures tell us, he is the God of knowledge. Are you hearing me? And the scriptures teach of the wisdom we apply if we ought to deal with knowledge. Because knowledge is not the primary thing. Even though people come to church to receive it. Some people come to the presence of God and say, I'm going to receive knowledge. But knowledge is not the primary principle for the Christian. The primary principle of the Christian is wisdom. With wisdom... The Bible says, is the principal sin. Are you hearing me? It's the primary sin. In other words, for every knowledge that is sent out to you, it cannot benefit if it carries no understanding. And if the understanding is not beneficial, then therewith wisdom is frustrated. That is why the Bible tells us that wisdom rests where understanding is. Now, the Bible seeks to establish a man in that line, okay? Step number one, receive the wisdom of God. Step number two, carry the understanding of wisdom. What is understanding? Understanding is a place where a man can prove the things of wisdom and attach value to them. That's understanding. So he says, if you are a house, if you are the temple of God, he tells you that with a house, with, a, with wisdom, the Bible says, a house is built. And with understanding, the house is established. And with knowledge, the Bible says, cometh and fills all precious, pleasant riches. The riches come by reason of knowledge. So, sometimes some people think that you can receive knowledge without its understanding and its wisdom. Sometimes in the body of Christ, we have a situation where you find people who carry knowledge without the understanding of the wisdom of that knowledge. And thereby, the, most, the place that is ministered most to is the mind. Are you hearing me? And that is why we produce the place of Christianity that knows too much but cannot produce too much. Are you hearing me? And then that place where now people start to question. You understand? You're born again. <laughs> but you're failing. 
You understand? You're in a family, you're born again. And you have guys who are not born again, and they're all successful, and you're failing. But you're spiritual. You claim you know God. And I tell Christians, this is hard to chew, but there's nothing dissipating like not looking like the anointing you claim to carry. It's one thing when you wake up and say, I'm above and not beneath. I'm the head and not the tail. I'm more than a conqueror. By Christ who strengthens me. Even if it takes how long, the Lord will come out for me. You can speak all those wonderful scriptures and they are wonderful for you to speak. But there is a place you can never minister to certain people if you can't manifest certain things. Say Amen. amen. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Imagine I'm waking up every day and I'm saying, Me, I am born again. I'm so blessed. You understand it? First lend me some 10K. But I'm so blessed. <laughs> you get my point? That's why I told Christians, every Christian must have a pride because of faith. You see, there's a pride that is indifferent because the man is aligned in the flesh. Okay? That is entirely carnality. There is a place of the boasting, which is in God. He says, for where is our boasting seven faith? Are you hearing me? The substance that you carry, are you hearing me? For the things you hope for, and the evidence that you carry for the things not seen should give you a certain pride. You get what I'm trying to tell you? You can't go to your family members and you're a man of God, and they're not born again, and you tell them, I want food, and you think you preach to them Christ. You can't. You get my point? Because if your Christ can't give you food, and you're trying to give him to me as an everlasting life, eh? you know there was a time we used to live where a Christian would say, Ah, me, I don't care if I have nothing, as long as I go to heaven. Shut up. <laughs> so why was Jesus made poor? Come on, why did he become poor? That you go to heaven beggarly? Ask for food and tell people After eating you tell them By the way Jesus of Nazareth was anointed with the Holy Spirit and with power And he went about doing good and healing all of them that were oppressed of the devil For God was with him Okay Why didn't he heal you? And that is why for me personal prayer me, These are the examinations on my own self I always tell God Do in me what I ought to minister That is why when you look, read Paul's understanding of the mystery of ministration, okay? Because remember, there's a pendulum here that I have appeared unto you both to be a witness and a minister of those things which I have shown thee and in those things in which I will appear. If I have to be at a place where I have to minister to certain people, the primary place of my of ministration ought to be the things Christ has done in me. That is why Paul says, I would rather not speak, save of the things Christ has wrought by me to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed. People will never do and listen if what you're speaking is not wrought in you. Who understands what I'm saying? So he says, if I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not wrought by me to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed. The reason why people don't do the word we teach them is because primarily we float the principle of being those things routing us. That is why in Thessalonians, Paul says, and for such we became a pattern. Paul was not approved a worker of the gospel, one which lays down the gospel simply by the words that he spoke to the multitudes. But how he says, in, I, I think in Timothy, he says, How be for this cause I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus might show forth all the long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him in life everlasting. In other words, Paul is positioned not only to preach patterns, but to be a pattern. I want to be something before I preach it. Because there is nothing that makes sense about it if I cannot be what I'm preaching. That is called, in Timothy, it's called faith feigned <laughs> it's faith feigned the word there for feigning faith is a place where a man deceives nobody but himself do you understand what I'm saying a place where a man deceives that's why he says the end of the commandment is what is love out of a pure heart and of a good conscience because remember the problem when I began the problem with the conscience in, in, in the scriptures that I read for you in Matthew was that at that, that particular place of, of, of conscience which ought to be the light of the human spirit the place that he has God is darkened are you with me? are you with me? now he says that the end of commandment is love out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned the faith that does not lie to itself 
They, do you know how painful it is for you to say things and everyone says, but... Mm, mm. No. Do you understand? Do you understand? You're speaking and people are saying, mm, mm, there's, there's something wrong. No. This is You're giving us solutions that don't work for you. That's what rich doctors do. They give wealth when they are broke. You understand what I'm trying to tell you? (laughs) You understand where I'm coming from? Tell your neighbor, I must look the part. Tell them I must look the part. Tell them I must look the part. Tell them I must look the part. I must. It's a must. I must look the part. Yes, your confession is wonderful. Communication of your faith can only become effectual when you acknowledge every good thing. Say, I must look the part. I must look the part in the name of Jesus. If I say I'm blessed, I must look blessed. If I'm some anointed, I must look anointed. If I say I'm wise, I must speak wisdom. You understand? I, I must look the part. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and if you go back to Timothy, you realize that the, 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 faith, the faith is faith. What does the next verse say? And he says, from which some people, having swabbed off, have turned aside unto vain jangling. They are speaking things that are useless. They are speaking, but they are useless. Because they are weighed by the Spirit. That is why you realize that every child of God, when the Lord has to use you, in whichever way he will lose you, use you, never forget the first, one of the first temptations, or testations, not temptations, one of the first testations of a minister, not a Christian, of a minister, is the weight. That is why if you read the story of, of, of Samson, you realize that he needed a place. You, you remember the experience of Ascalon, the valley of Ascalon? In fact, the root word of Ascalon is a place where a man's spirit is weighed against truth. For God to exactly help you know where you stand against truth or for the truth. That is why there's a place where everybody should put a torch in their spirit and say, examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. There's a place of examination. Nobody is supposed to examine you. No. There's a place where you ought to examine yourself and say, God, how far have I gone with this? How far have I gone with that? How far is this moving in my life? How far is this happening in my life? Because if you judge yourself, the Bible says, then there will be no need for any man to judge you. And that's a place that sets you above judgment. And that's why I don't understand men who judge men who have already judged themselves. <laughs> why? Because they don't even know when the man judged himself. You get where I'm coming from? So if you didn't know when the man judged himself, where do you get the opportunity, or sorry, the audacity to judge a man with who you know not how he dealt with God before you came to judging him? You, do you understand where I'm coming from? You see, one time I told people something controversial. And um, some people didn't understand, understand me. I told them one time that there is a place, are you hearing me, in God, where a man is above judgment. And say, no way, no way, no way. I, no, I don't believe it. No, you see, you read the word. <laughs> That's why when Paul is judging with people, he says, it's a small thing that I should be judged of you. Or of a man's judgment. For I judge not my own self. Why? Because he knows nothing of himself. The more the Lord starts to consume you, there is a place where you can't... (laughs) Now Paul is in a place where he's dead. Totally. You can't judge a man who is dead. How how often do we judge dead men? How can you say a dead man stole money? A dead man lied? Do you get where I'm coming from? Even the most horrible people, when they die, we speak well of them in their funerals. He was a good man. You wait when Kony dies. But he was a good man. He was a hard worker. He loved children. You understand where I'm coming from? (laughs) Are you with me? Give me the amplified of that. Amplified for me. First Corinthians. He says, listen. But as for me personally, it matters very little to me that I should be put on trial by you on this point of judgment. That you or any other man tribunal should investigate and question, cross-question me. I don't even put myself on trial and judge myself. Are you hearing me? Next verse. He says, I'm not conscious of anything against myself. And I... 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 Can I slap somebody? He says... 
I, you say, I feel, listen, but I'm not vindicated and acquitted before God on that account. It is the Lord Himself who examines. Do you understand? Now, if you cannot examine how the man has walked in God, you carry no place of judging. That's why the Lord Jesus, in His own wisdom, He says, I hear, therefore I judge. In other words, if I have not had God, I can't judge a matter. I can't judge a matter if I have not had God. Now, this is my fear with judgment. My fear with judgment is judging people. Are you hearing me? Who God has exempted from judgment from any man, even themselves. See, that's why we, one time I want to teach about the dimensions of the spirit, okay? First, second, third, fourth dimension. It's, 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 it's a place of maturity for you to understand that there is a dealing God wants to deal with us. And there is a dealing in God where a man can mature above judgment. You understand? Why? Because God has worked into him the most wonderful maturities and sanctifications of the spirit and to obedience. Are you hearing me? There are people God has dealt with. You see, there are people who, who are dealing with God. But there are people God has dealt with. Are you hearing me? Listen, he comes to a man and tells him huh, that no weapon he has not examined the state of that man. Eh? Look at his servant. He has not examined the state of that man. No. He has just examined the covenant with that man. Israel. He says, no weapon fashioned against you shall what? Prosper. And every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, thou, 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 he says, shall condemn. You understand? This is the heritage of the apostle graces of the Lord. And their righteousness listen God says it's of me you know, if, if you want to judge he says if you want to judge how right they are or how wrong they are judge me this is God saying if you want to judge there are certain people you can't judge he tells you they are righteous if you want to judge them judge me who created them and I anointed them I asked a man God Listen, some of you have heard of the story of one gentleman called Branham, William Branham. And some of you have heard of the story of the prophetic word that came out of Kenneth e. Hagin, prophesying the death of William Branham. And the Lord says, I'm taking my servant away. And there's nothing William Branham could do, even though he was a prophet. Are you hearing me? When God wants to clear out a man, he doesn't need your opinion. He will clear him out like that. But if he should keep a man, judge God Amen. for keeping him alive. You get it? That's why he says, who are you to judge another man's servant? That, that's the place of service. For if he falls, he doesn't fall before the tribunal. No, he falls before me. And if he should stand, the Bible says, he stands before me. And listen to the mind of God. But now God is able to make him stand. You know, even when the guy is falling, God is doing like this, get up. <laughs> you understand? Get up. The only challenge is we don't see when God is making the man stand. Are you hearing me? That is why I've realized there is a place of immaturity. When certain men judge according to observation. Are you hearing me? Because when you deal with the way God thinks, that's another someone will sleep here. Money. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now let's go back to Romans where we're at. He speaks of the darkening of the conscience. The next verse says, uh-huh, let's read. Let's read. No one, ah, important. Hi, yeah, yeah. Get your guns. He says, no one, listen, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate. The one, listen, and love the other. Oh, he will stand by and be devoted to the one and despise and be against the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And what does the scripture define mammon as? Deceitful riches, money, possessions, or whatever is trusted in. Let me first talk about what men trust in. 
When you look at situations where a certain person can look at a savings account and say, I trust in this. Somebody can look at an account with a, an insurance company, life insurance, and say, I trust in this, in case I die. By the Christians, how do you in case yourself before 70? That's why you die early. How do you in case yourself before the age of 70? You never know. <laughs> what? <laughs> What? <laughs> you don't know the will of God concerning your life? The Bible says he has made known unto us hey, the mystery of his will. He has made known unto us the mystery of his will. We're not ignorant of the will of God concerning our lives. That's why I pity some people who can imagine they are going to die next. I pity such people. You never know Munang because God can decide. Listen, how? You don't know? Okay. And now I've realized therein is the defiling. Because look at it. You think you can die early. Who told you? You get my point? <laughs> you see, some Christians, sometimes I need to deal with them the, of the, because of, by the way God thinks. Because you see, many of you listen to the devil without knowledge. Somebody one time called me and told me, Apostle Grace, I have three texts. I asked her, who told you? Yeah, I'm that crazy. I, but I have three retakes. I said, yes, who told you? I went to the university and then I checked my results and I found retakes. Yes, and I said, yes, you found retakes, but who told you? Did God say you have a retake or the machine said you have a retake? <laughs> Come on! <laughs> Whose report will you believe? This guy is not realistic. When Christ, which is your real life, shall appear, then shall you appear with retakes. No, he says, then shall you appear with him in splendor and in glory. I told her, go back again. She started laughing at us. <laughs> I don't see them anymore. I told her, that's what I was trying to tell you. I told her that's what I was trying to tell you all along. If your eye be single, then the whole body will be what? I told her that's what I was trying to tell you. How did they change? I'm poor. Who told you? I am sick. Who told you? I feel. Yes. Who told you? Who told you? But I don't feel. Yes. Who told you. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. That is, I, I'm trying to take the Christian to a place of if God hasn't said it, it's not true. Whether the newspapers have spoken, whether radio has announced, whether you feel it or you don't, it's not true. Hallelujah. So he says in Matthew that you cannot serve two masters. Now, that introduces you to what, something I wanted to qualify before I share. Money is a God. Money is a God. God looks at money as a small God, but it's a God. Hallelujah. And he says you cannot serve. In other words, there are two kinds of people in this world. Men who serve God and men who serve money. There is no middle ground. You can't be neither hot nor cold. You spat the other side. Okay? There are people in this world who serve God and there are people in this world who serve money. And look at what the scripture says. The scripture says that you will hate one and love the other. Or you will stand by and be devoted to one and despise and be against the other. You cannot serve God and man. You can't. You can't. Give me the blessed version of the same verse. He says, you can't worship two gods. You can't worship two gods. He says, at once, loving one God, you'll end up hating the other. Adoring one feeds content for the other. You cannot worship God and money both, because both are gods and you have to worship one. 
I'm going to prove to you how people worship money. And some of you are going to be shocked. Let me explain. When you go back to the amplification, he speaks of a place where men put trust in. Whatever you put your trust in, you worship. Whether you know or you don't know. There's somebody who gets 10,000 in their pocket and says, I cannot give this to a poor person because I need supper. So, where is your trust? In the Lord or the 10,000 shillings? So, who are you serving? Who are you going to despise? Do you understand what I'm saying? See, some people don't know they do it, yet they do it. I'll give you an example, and I'm sorry I'm going to say this, but I'm going to qualify it by the end of it. Okay? Do you know Christians who live on budgets? I asked the Christian one time, I told him, look, brother, help me understand. Have you ever budgeted for heaven? Have you ever woken up in the morning one day, in the air, and say, I'm going to win a hundred souls? I'm going to win, give this much in my hour. I'm going to reach out to these many people. If you can't budget for God, how come you have enough time to even budget for money? No, help me understand this. If, how many souls have you won this year? But I can tell how much money you've spent this year. I told people when I was working in a bank, one man died, I remember a sheikh, Muslim. He told his son, who was a very close friend of mine, he told him, every year I've been giving th- uh, $300,000 to mosques. This is my death wish, as the sole heir of my things. Always give to the mosque $300,000. And he did it faithfully. He told him, never give less, only give above. This is a Muslim. You understand? And the Lord blesses their nations. And Christians are in Uganda. <laughs> Ask your neighbor, Mama, no God. <laughs> don't worry, I'm going to explain that. Ah, don't worry, I'm going to explain that. <laughs> Let's continue. <laughs> You see, when, listen, when you trust in money, when you trust in money and say this is my trust, when you look and examine yourself and feel that every time I have money, I trust. Every time I have money, I trust. Then trust me, you're worshipping it without knowing. God wants to take you to a place where you say, I have God. Even if my account is empty, I have God. Even if they test me on the job, I have God. Even if I don't have money for rent, I have God. You love one, you listen, you will stand by, listen, stand by and be devoted. Have you ever asked yourself how somebody can be faithful at a workplace every day from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. for five years? You understand, 10 years, and then they get promotions and a few pay checks, increase of salary, and they've never, never defaulted to go to work, except if there was a genuine sickness. They've always been at work. But you plead with the guy to come to church. How come you were faithful? How come you came on time at work? You don't reach late at work and you reach late at church. Come on. Who are you devoted to? Who are you standing by? Hallelujah. Who are you devoted to? Listen, even if you make a million dollars every day, there has to be a place where you say, no, this is God time. <laughs> even people who you, you, they must know that when that guy has God time, it's God time. Do you know how many people have literally been stripped off from worship? They work Monday to Sunday, Monday to Sunday, Monday to Sunday. That is bondage. God deliver you. And get you a job that can allow you to pray on Sunday. That's the bread of sorrow. It's a spirit of struggle. Before you know that, they grow up and up to 10 years in the bank, they get high blood pressure, 
diabetes. They fall down and pass out, get miscarriages, working on the teal, and then they go home, you know, frustrated. And then tomorrow they wake up and you look back, you've built this wonderful ministry for a certain guy, business, and you have nothing to yourself. Why? Because all your life you worshipped it. Until listen, until listen, what makes money money? Let me help you understand this. Money. It's simple. You think about it. Think about it. What makes money, money? A guy got... Somebody give me a note. Any note. Money. Let me show you. Thank you. How much is this? Who told you? How much is this? Who told you? Huh? The writing. Isn't it? Half is what? 50,000. Why is it 50,000? It's written. Why is this 20,000? It's written. By the authority of a man, this became 20,000. A man woke up. And you have a Bible. Come on. By the authority of a man, in English language, a man wrote 50,000 shillings. Put on zero and legalized it. People stand in front of banks, banks to keep what a man invented. You understand? They, they kill people for what a man invented. They blackmail their own people, families and friends because of they divorce and walk out of marriages because of something a man wrote. He just, simple. If he wants to make this five million, he just adds a zero. Nothing else. Now, how can you? Who can say, Rasa Katala? Broseketeleba. Sindereketeleba. Listen, he says, You shall decree a thing. That is why when he came to the Christian, he told us, no, you, you, you come without man and buy. Because your currency, your currency is not paper. Uh -uh. Your currency is God. If this is your currency, then this is your God. What makes us prosperous is not this. We can be without this and still be prosperous. See, a man wakes up in the morning and God tells him, go to a land I will show you. There was no currents. He tells him, go to a land I will show you. There was no currents. And the man stands there and tells him, Look north, east, west, for all of that I have given thee. There was no what? Currency. But there was, listen, Christians work on blessing, not saving. I'm not saying don't have a savings account. No. I'm only saying don't hold more than is met. The scriptures are clear. Some people hold more than they met because they trust in that. And whatever you trust, you worship. Can I go deeper? Let's go back. Let's go to where we are in, 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 in Bishop, thank you. So, <laughs> listen. Give me the message version. Why are you laughing? <laughs> Read. You cannot what? I have a few minutes. Let's go. You cannot worship two gods at once. Loving one god, you'll end up hating the other. End up. In other words, you don't plan it. You just end up. Are you hearing me? Adoration of one feeds content for the other. You can't worship God and money both. Mammon is money. Next verse says, uh -huh. if you decide, listen, for God, living a life of God worship, it follows that you don't fuss about what's on the table. 
at meal times budget or whether the clothes in your closet are in fashion there is far more to your life than the food you put in your stomach more to your outer appearance than the clothes you hang on your body look at the bags free and unfettered not tied down to a job description careless in the care careless in the care come on put it on your whatsapp wall today when you go back put it on your status and say i'm careless in the care of god tell your neighbor i'm careless in the care of god have you ever had a bad a, a, a bad budgeting Look at the bags. Have you ever had a bad budgeting? Help me. Have you ever had a bad budgeting? Does it lack? <laughs> That's the god of this world. The god of this world. Plutus. Who knows Plutus? The Greek God for money. That's why your study is called Plutonomics. The study of managing wealth. Help me. You know it. Eh? The study of managing wealth. Platonomics is the God of money. Jehovah God has not called us eh? to manage earthly finances with a carnal mentality of lack. That's why he became poor from day one. That when you enter salvation, you don't enter poor man trying to give to become rich. No. You enter salvation knowing I'm rich. Me, I would walk in my pockets. For example, I, can't, I don't have money in my pockets. But I'm not worried. Because of the anointing upon me, the worker is worthy of his meat. You understand? I remember my university days. I used to wake up in the morning and... I wake up and then you have 5,000. And then that 5,000 tells you, man, you don't have enough. The moment that thought comes into my head, I say, send the Lakeista. I go in the canteen and I spend it all. And somebody says, but you're not wise. <laughs> How can you spend it? I'm trying to tell the devil, I don't need 5,000 in my pocket to tell me I'm rich. I don't need 5,000 in my pocket for me to know I'm rich. Listen, if what I have, the devil has to make me think that because I have 5,000, therefore I'm lacking. I'm going to spend it all and prove to him that tomorrow has its own to worry. Carelessly, in the care of God. Understand me. The day you wake up and you have only 20,000 in your pocket, just say, I'm rich, I'm rich, I'm rich, I'm rich. Go to a restaurant. That day look for a restaurant that charges 20k. And God asks you, I'm rich, I'm rich. Go, come out, tell it. From that day, the devil stopped tempting me that way. He stopped tempting me that way. He realized, no, if he runs out of money, he'll just make, he'll just manifest more. Let me leave him. I'm not tempted anymore like that. I am not tempted anymore like that. But it was once a temptation. Now I can't give. If I give, where will I? Who is you? Who, in whom do you trust? We used to give our transport and then you sit in a taxi praying in tongues. Sileba, 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 Sileba. And then you say, Masao. And a conductor opens the car like you paid. And, says, and then you look at him and say, Furuma now, we. Listen, one time, let me tell you a story, but don't try this at home. Let me tell you a story, but don't try this at home. One time there was a couple. A lady was Australian, the husband was Ugandan. 
And then I wanted to meet them about money. I mean, I'm in a ministry. I wanted to talk. So I tell them, let's go in an expensive restaurant. We go in an expensive restaurant. And I tell them, today I'm taking you out. The treat is free. I looked into my wallet. And I didn't have money. And I said, God, at this level, I can't trust that because there is no money in my wallet, therefore, I'm not going to... I told them, no, it's on me, come. They came. Listen, everything they ordered, I was swallowing saliva. (laughs) Do you have an ice cream, please? Can you get me four scoops? Yeah, that one, one with sherry. Yeah, that one, that one. And then you look at the price. Ding! Do you have a Caribbean jack chicken with some rice and a few beef stripes on the side? Ding! They ate. But I can tell you the truth. Every time they were eating, in my head I was saying, Riste Leke. Jire Basata. I'm telling you what I did. I would rather speak of the things Christ has wrought in me. I wish I was lying. Then after they finished eating, I said, God, I don't know whether you're going to send an angel. I don't know whether you're going to make them forget. I don't know whether you're going to pause this restaurant. And then I can type in the amount. I don't know. I had to bless them. I couldn't show them my poverty. You know, that's, that's my problem. I can't show you I'm broke. It's not godly. You know, some Christians, they come and show they are broke. You, you see, I've been struggling for a week. My children are suffering. <laughs> After they finished eating, Rosie Kelly, I told the lady, please get us the bill. Listen, when you know that your wallet doesn't have enough money, and you ask for the bill. It's the craziest feeling you can ever have. After 10 minutes, the woman came and said, Excuse me, sir. Some lady came in and paid for you, the whole table. I said, wait, 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 wait. First go back and check. I knew something had happened. First go back and make sure. She went back. She came back. Yes. Some lady came and said I paid for the three. She paid for the three of you, sir. I told her, okay, it's okay. Ah, oh, we miss her. Then I shook the past and his wife. I bid them goodbye. And then I went in a corner of a, ch- of a certain building. And then I said to My God shall supply all your needs according. Tell your neighbor I'm crazy. Don't try this at home. Except if you have enough faith. I'm on. I'm running out of time. I want to, somebody's getting delivered. Do you know if, if somebody is too careful in God? Do you know what it means to be careful in the care of God? That's the law. Do even as God does. And your dog CS. I am Baba Teyamba. When a man is too careful in God, he can even know the currency by touching it. Have you seen people who give like that? Now this is this must be ten. They love the guy so much, they know how it feels like. I mean, come on, somebody. He, he loves mammon so much. He, he can feel and know this, this one is 10. This one is mammon 10,000. This one is mammon 20,000. This is mammon 50,000. This is mammon 5K. Mammon 5K. Mammon 5K. If 
he brings that mammon 5k out and then by mistake he saw 10k. Ah, oh, you are Tell your neighbor what you catch, give it. Be careless in the care of God. But that's not reasonable. You have to understand that the world lives in, in a state of meager resources. There's always lack somewhere. People have to plan. And, and listen, me, I don't plan for my money, but I'm not broke. Listen, people have given me stuff I didn't plan for. What are you talking about? Listen, he says, and you count far more to him than that. Next verse says, has anyone by fasting in front of the mirror even ever gotten taller so much as in image? All this time and money wasted on fashion. Do you think it makes the much difference? Instead of looking at the fashions, yeah, walk out into the fields and look at the wild flowers. They never print or so. But have you ever seen color and design quite like it? The ten best dressed men and women in the country look shabby alongside them. If God gives such attention to the appearance of wild flowers, most of which are never even seen, don't you think he will attend to you? Take pride in do his best for you. Take pride in God. He will look after you. I said he will look after you. There's a woman here and you don't even have fish for next time. Tell your children, darling, we shall be just fine. Next verse. What I'm trying to do here is get you to what? Not to be so preoccupied with getting. Getting. So you can respond to God's giving. What does the next verse say? People who don't know God and the way he works fast over these things. When you see a man in that life, I'm not going to do this. I must plan this. They that person doesn't know God and how he works. But you know both God and how he works. What does the next verse say? Steep your life in God reality, God initiative, God provisions. Don't worry about missing out. You'll find all your everyday human concerns will be met. If you don't worry that I, I, I think I might, not, I might not make it. You know some kid one time called me and told me, Apostle, pray for me. I don't have fees. You should have called me and told me, pray for me. I thank God for fees. But when you tell me you don't have fees, I don't know how to pray for you. Don't worry about missing out. You will not miss out. He says, when you don't worry, he says, you'll find all your day human concerns will be met. Me, I don't worry about anything concerning me financially. I don't, listen, even when you don't have a cent, walk back home not worried. That's God reality. God reality does not look at the things that are seen, but it looks at the things which are not seen. And what does the next verse say? Uh huh. Give your entire attention to what God is doing right now. I don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up when the time comes. Do you know why Christians, do you know why Christians don't give? They worry about tomorrow. That is why me, I have a principle. When I get in a place and the devil tempts me to worry about tomorrow, I give big. I give big. That's what I do. God knows it. I give big. I, I don't care whether it's land or car, whatever. The moment I get in a place where I have to worry about tomorrow, I get something big and I tell the devil, you don't understand me. This is Apostle Grace you're tempting. Go and tempt another guy who has just joined, not me. Because I have refused to put myself in a state where a king's son is worried. Me, I told people, right now, President Museveni, the president of our nation, God bless his soul. If that man tomorrow tells his boy or one of his kids and they say, Daddy, I'm getting married. They don't say, Ah, yeah, wedding meeting. And the problem is you put it in the time when people don't have money. No, he just says, That's okay, my daughter. This is the president's child. What? Oh, 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 oh. oh, child of God. King of kings, Lord of lords. Then you worry about a wedding meeting. 
people didn't come. Then you get pissed at people. Kind of used to think that Martin would help me. But that guy, he has not helped me. Come on, come on. Martin is not your salvation. Rita is not your redemption. Paul is not your point of story. He is God. Let me say it in Luganda. Takuyamba rekeyo. If they won't help you, God will still help you. If they won't come out for you, God will still come out for you. If they don't get that's okay. You still have God. If you worry. Oh, so and so. No. God will come out for you. My trust is in the Lord. Oh, oh, I love when I have to trust. I love when I have to trust. I love when I look at the account and my demand is bigger than what's counting on that machine. I love those places because that's the place where God He says, give your entire attention to what God is doing right now. What is He doing? Fanero, what is He doing? Your home church, you attend to that. Give into that. Trust into that. Invest in that. Let God attend your business. When you find a guy who won't give, why? Because he trusts in money. You see, Ecclesiastes says, it's true, 10, 19, money answers all things. But the challenge with Christians is they always end there. They don't know how to call it. Let me tell you. Let me tell you. If money is your Lord, it doesn't answer you. You answer to it. That scripture is for things above money. If, if, if he's your master... Help me understand scripture. Who answers to the other? The servant answers to the master. So do you want to tell me that money answering all things means that everybody can order it? No. There are people in this world who are master over money and there are people in this world to whom money is master. Are you with me? Are you with me? Do you understand what I'm saying? Let me tell you. Let me give you an example. How do you put money to your submission? Very simple. One of the principles in the scriptures is clear. He that has pity on the poor lendeth to the Lord. Lendeth. Doesn't give. Lendeth. He takes it as a loan. But the same Bible in Proverbs 22 tells us that he that lend is borrows is a servant to him that lends. That means that when you give to the poor, when you pity the poor, are you hearing me? You lend to God and put him in a position of serving you financially. But the poor are not only people financially. There are people who are poor spiritually. Preaching the gospel to those people is an amount of money spent. Come on, think with me. So if you don't give in the ministry, where you go to church, where you go for fellowship? He says he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Do you think he was talking about physically poor people? No, he said you shall always have the poor among you. He's talking about spiritually poor people. Those people need a gospel to reach out to them. You get where I'm coming from. If we tell people we're going for prison ministry, they are poor, even spiritually, and they tell you give, and then you find a person who just speaks, speaks ah, no, I have to plan for my weekend. You understand? It's sad that some people still think like that. That is why they manipulate you. You say, God has told me, give me a hundred million if you want this to move, because you've refused. And amazingly, when, they, when they're manipulated, they give. Because remember again, they're putting trust in You heard of a story of, I don't know, some of you have never heard of it. You know a gentleman called Benson Idahosa? Benson Idahosa one time hosted T.L. Osborne and his wife in Nigeria. And they were preaching in a city and then they had to fly out over to Lagos for another meeting. And then there was a, the plane was taken off. And then Idahosa ran. He drove to the airport, went to that plane that was going, and entered that plane and said, <clears throat> I want a volunteer here. Two volunteers to give me two seats because there are two ministers of God that must be in Lagos today. Do you understand? Everyone looked at this guy and got what? Peace. Praise the Lord. 
And when they get pissed, of course, people are asking themselves, why is this guy doing this? Why is he even wasting our time for us to go? Now, the, the story says that on that plane there was a businessman called Aliko Dankote. How many of you have heard of that guy? You know one of the richest guys in the world? Yeah, in Africa. He was on that plane. He wasn't even a serious guy in believing what? No. This guy, <clears throat> when he had it, he had an assistant. He was going for a business meeting. Normal business guy. He gets his assistant and tells him, let's give these seats to men of God. And when they gave Tiel Osborne the seat and his wife, this guy turns to Dampote and tells him, you're going to be the richest man on the face of this continent. Your name. Listen. That was not hard work. Try to understand the blessing. That, 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 that was... What do you think it takes for God to bless you? He told him, your name is going to be great. It's going to be known across the world. Wealth is going to be your story. Men are going to know you for wealth on this continent. And that was it. The rest was history. Everything that worked in Ikote Dankote's life after that was not a hard worker. It was the blessing of a man of God who spoke a blessing on him because he gave a place for another man of God to go and preach the gospel. The gospel has firmer returns. The gospel has firmer returns than any business in this world. Why do you think about local Do you see Roman Catholics in Biwempe? No, it's only about local. Do you see Muslims in Biwempe? No. They're just speaking in tongues and worshipping the God of money. Thessalonica, like a mother cuddled her own babies. He says, I cuddled you and nursed you. But there's a position where Thessalonica has now to go to the Corinth and ask now, what can I do in the ministry? Because the blessing in giving to God is bigger than the, bless, the, 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 the reward you'll get in following Mammon. Mammon, listen, he says the love for money is the root of all, all, all evil, all evil. And he says that many have pierced themselves with many a sorrow. The ransom of a man's riches. Life, sorry, are his riches. The ransom of a man's life are his riches. You find a Christian who is not tithing and is suffering from chronic hypertension. He refused to tithe. Now he's paying blacks of his life every week. The kidneys are failing. Let me tell you, tithers don't die of such diseases. The guy refuses to do principles. Ransom of a man's riches is his life. So the devil does what? He afflicts the man's life. And before you know that, what you are not tithing, you spend it in drugs every week and you're happy. Why? Who knows the meaning of the doctor's sign? Go and read about it. Those two snakes crossing each other. What's the meaning? The God of making profit. You read. Some of you never read. So, if you fail to profit in God, the devil makes profit out of you. You fall sick. God forbid. God forbid. Because either way it will go. Even if it takes 20 years, it still does what? Goes. But me, I'm under grace. Yes. <laughs> yes, you are. That's why Jesus tells them in Luke you give tithes and meats. And he says, This you ought to do and not leave out the rest. Meaning, Jesus knows the tithe is godly. But that's the least for a believer. It's the least because he says, listen, somebody says, I don't see it in the New Testament. Read for yourself. He says, one unto you scribes and, 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 and Pharisees, hypocrites. For ye pay tithe of mint and anise and coming, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. He says, this ought ye to have done, and not to leave out the others undone. Does that mean he disqualifies it? He says, it's okay for you to have it, but there are other things also to do, deeper. But he hasn't said that he has disqualified it. That's the list. You understand? Tithe was not invented by Moses. Try to understand. Oh, these were instructions to the children of Israel. Come on. Who told Abraham to tithe? Was it the law? Come on. Who told Jacob to tithe? Was it the law? Come on. You are Abraham's seed. It's supposed to work automatic. It's not even a request. No. In your home church, wherever you are fed, where you now fed, give the Lord his tithe. Give him his first fruits. The Bible says the root is holy. Then the whole lamp is holy. The Bible is very clear. 
about these things. Get your annual salary every year. Give one month to the Lord full and then give your tithe. Because the Bible says, that, Yeah, in, yeah, out. You shall give your first fruits. Now, somebody can give first fruit and they're saying, But I'm not getting promoted. My friends are growing. Listen, first fruit is very clear. Even the Greek testimony, the Hebrew, sorry, root from the word of first fruit is the place where a man places ownership upon what which must promote him. That's why some of you are not growing in your workplaces. When you're a worshiper, was your first seed the first fruit? So, why are you struggling telling people, for us people don't come for our shows. People don't give to our city. For us we are worshippers, but people don't support us. Come on, shut up. Every worker is worthy of his meat. Come on, musicians, spice. Then they say, we go and sing, and then they don't give you money. What did you do? You ate the Lord's tithe. You ate the Lord's first fruit. And then you're complaining. Listen, first fruit, get one salary every year and give it to God. As of to your promotion or the new job you've received. For me, I used to do it every year. Because I know that that's the instruction. You shall bring it in every year. You're employed. The 12 months, one month should not be yours. It's scripture. It's in the Bible. Praise the Lord. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all your increase. Every year you get a pay increase. Get that one amount. Take it to your priest. Ezekiel 44 verse 30. Let him cause a blessing to settle. That's what Ezekiel says, not Moses. He says, and the first of all fruits and of all kinds of things, every oblation of every sort of oblation shall be the priest. Not plural. You shall also give unto the priest the first of your door that he may cause. He may cause. Oh no, how can I when I have rent? How can I when I have to pay fees? How can I when I see have to pay a loan? Who told you to borrow? He said you shall not borrow. You shall learn. Who told you to borrow? Budget. You looked at your account and it was empty. And your soul told you, I think I better, I better, I better borrow. That's the only way I'll survive. That's human effort to fulfill promises of God. He said you shall lend to nations. That's why Christians don't, are not lending nations. No, they are paying loans. They are believing God. They even testify. I thank God. I had a loan. <laughs> Then another kind of sister taps on her back. That's right, darling. Tell him. But I thank God because he paid my loan. Listen, we're not supposed to be paying loans. We're supposed to be lending nations. Lending nations. Lending nations. There are our blessings of seed of faith. What? Listen, whatever is not enough for you to do something, sometimes you have to say, God, I'm going to give this amount. Me, these are things I do and they've worked. It's okay. If you don't, that's your problem. Trust in your God, Mammon. Trust in Mammon. Continue trusting in Mammon. That is why I told people, once you begin church, you're going to deal with Thessalonica. You're going to deal with spiritual babies. Don't force them to give. Don't pressure them to give. No. Just preach to them. Help them grow. Because where your heart is, your treasure is also. Don't forget that. But do you realize that when he was in Thessalonica, he was nursing? Baby, baby. Do babies give? No. They are given milk. Do babies give? No. They are dressed, they are clothed. Everything is done for them. You understand? How do you ask your pastor for money? We give, yes. But how do you ask a man who teaches you? (laughs) Do you understand where I'm coming from? What has he taught you? You are supposed to be in your churches, blessing your pastors wherever you are. Galatians 6 6. Let him that is taught in the word communicate and to him that teaches him in all good things. He says, Let him that is taught in the word communicate and to him that teaches in all good things. That's the instruction. You're supposed to bless your wherever your pastors are. This is a fellowship. Some of you come from churches. Bless your men of God. Bless them. You bless them. You just bless them. Listen, if you don't bless him, he has not told you. Period. Period. Do you get where I'm coming from? But then some of you go to your men of God and ask them for rent. And they will give you. But Thessalonica, grow out. Get to Corinth. Because when you get to Corinth, you realize he starts to teach them about finances. 
But you realize Corinth is not a faithful church. That's why it tells them, hey, I want to bring you to remembrance of one, 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 one commitment you, 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 you gave, sir. You, you committed a year ago in a car, and, and, I, and I zealously, I, 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 he says, for I know the fraudness of your mind, for which I boast of you to them of Macedonia, that Achaia, them, the Corinthians, he says, was ready a year ago, and your zeal has provoked very many. Next verse. And he says, you have, yet have I sent the brethren, this our boasting of you should be in vain in this behalf. As I have said, you may be ready. In other words, they pledged for, to give something a year ago. They failed to give it. But yet when Paul went and says, the Corinthians pledged something last year. He says, he boasted on their behalf. And their zeal provoked many. But then there's a situation where a man's zeal is provoking many, yet he himself is not obedient. Do you know people who pledge and they never fulfill? I am going to give you two million. Then one is provoked to also say, even me too. Yet the guy who brought out the idea, <laughs> although there is a maturity in boasting over that which has not yet fulfilled, one to give zeal to them which must give, but number two to honor that they had the mind to. Number three, for the love that covers a multitude of sins. You get it? Then you start to see his teaching Corinth, um, how they, the heart must be made up because some of them they were forced. You get some people are forced to give. You, if you don't give, you see, that's why the Bible says, don't give on pressure. Don't, don't, those things of telling people, Manange, we are too desperate. Hey, if you don't give, we are going to die. Me, me, ah. Praise the Lord. He says, don't give in strife. Don't give on pressure or coercion. He says, it's expedient that a heart be made up before a man says, I'm going to give. Now, do you know many Christians, the reason why they receive not is because all their lives they have to be manipulated. Get a Malachi, this miracle. Get a what? You, the Lord has told me, you have to sow Psalms, $50 for Psalms 50. You understand? If you want it to get enter your life, if you want it to work in your life, if you want it to work in your life, you have to what? Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. So, because the Lord loves a cheerful what? Cheerful giver. You give with joy. But up to today, the, me, by the way, let me warn you. Even if it's us and we ever put you on pressure. But if you don't give, we are going to die. We are sinking. Please help us. Remember us. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. That means we've forgotten our God too. Now, the only challenge is this, men of God. Is when we want them to tithe when we are not tithing. We want to read. Mm -mm. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to give. We, 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 we don't want to give first fruits of our ministry. Some say, ah, but how your ministry is successful. Ask Bishop, we gave our first fruit even when we were indebted. Why? Because we needed to do the principle. The principle was more important than our need. Never forget that. The principle of God is more important than your need. You're not giving a broke God. He says, uh -huh, let each one huh, give as he has made up in his own mind and purposed in his heart. Not what? Reluctantly. Oh, my money. Oh, and the For God loves, he takes pleasure in prizes above other things and is unwilling to abandon or to do without a cheerful joyous prompt to do it giver whose heart is in his giving make up your mind first but if that's a hard place because that means we also don't want to receive from a worshiper of mammon if you if your heart is on mammon first get delivered from mammon because some people are held back by mammon not not i'm not led no the spirit was leading but mammon are you with me? So you see that the church in Corinthians, he teaches them because now they, are, they have shifted to a place of wanting to know. Then you go in Philippe and you realize that they gave his needs even when he was away. He told them, my God shall supply all your needs. He's talking to the Philippian church, not Thessalonica. Now Thessalonica is, is quoting that scripture and claiming it. My God shall supply, baby, all my needs. You're not giving according to his riches in glory. Amanda Grace, in the name of Jesus, continue claiming. 
Are you hearing me? But when you read the scriptures, you realize that now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving, receiving, but only you. Uh huh. Next verse. For even in Thessalonica, the babies, you sent me once and again more unto my necessities. Not because I desired a gift, but I desired a fruit that may abound to your account. Uh huh. But I have all, and I abound in all for. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent of your sacrifice acceptable. Now that one details that my God shall supply, verse 19, all your needs according to your riches in glory. Because they don't only even give only in the ministry, they give even to the man who goes to minister to the babes. So you see, Thessalonica, zero fold. Corinth, 30 fold. Philippe, 60 fold. Macedonia, a hundredfold. Why? Because the Bible testifies of them. The Bible says, who gave more than they expected? He testified of them to the Corinthian church. That's why when he's teaching the Corinthians, he only talks about Philippians uh, and, and, and who? Macedonians. He, he, he hates talking about Thessalonica when he's dealing with Corinthians. You get my point, eh? So he says, Moreover, brethren, we do you not wit to the do, do, we, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches in Macedonia. How be that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded on two riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record here, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty. That no, give me that message version. This is the verses verses four. Huh? Read in the message. Pleading for the privilege of helping out in the relief of poor Christians. There were poor Christians. You understand? Macedon, no, try to understand. Go back to the first verse. The first verse says, listen, my friends, I want to report on the surprising and generous ways in which God is working in the churches of Macedonian province. Fierce troubles came down on the people of those churches, pushing them to the very limit. The trial exposed their true colors. They were incredibly happy, even though they were so desperately poor. You understand? Listen, the pressure triggered something totally unexpected. An outpouring of poor, generous gifts. So you see, in poverty they were giving more. They were not saving. And next verse. I was there and I saw it for myself. They gave offerings of whatever they could, far more than they could afford. Pleading for the privilege of helping out in the relief. For to them, they didn't know they were poor. So they are poor, but they are giving to tell Paul, give poor Christians. Next verse. This was totally spontaneous, entirely their own idea, own idea, and caught us completely off guard. What explains it was that they had first given themselves unreservedly to God and to us. The other giving simply flowed out of the purpose of God working in their lives. That is maturity. They don't only give, but they give themselves also in the gospel. Today, what we do, we just manipulate Christians to give. Because if you don't talk to them, Thessalonica or Corinth, they won't give. Now, that is why we want to teach this. I'm finishing. Sorry, I've taken longer than usual. Don't worry, we are ending there. You'll sleep in Christmas. I don't usually preach this long. But the reason why I'm trying to preach this is, many of you, where we're coming from as a third world country, many of you have third world mentality. In a first world kingdom. Tell your neighbor, be delivered. Be delivered. Be delivered. Either serve God or serve Mammon. Hallelujah. Have you learned something? <laughs> Praise the Lord. For those of you who need biblical study on that, I have a thing called the Secrets of Divine Providence. There are five parts. I go deep and teach and teach and teach and teach and teach everything. I go on the tithe, I teach it well, give it to the poor, I teach it. You understand? One time I was reading that scripture of giving to the poor, and the Bible says that he shall, he shall look after him on his deathbed. You understand? That place where God even looks after you. He, I said, God, make me like that. Hallelujah. Tell your neighbor, God or Mammon. Praise the Lord Jesus. Get to your feet. If you say me, I want to be delivered from, 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 from holding back. Let me pray for you, Father. 
in the name of Jesus Christ. You have blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We only ask you to help us be good stewards. Help us not to worry. Help us not to fret. Help us not to plan, but to allow you to care for us carelessly, as we are careless. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at UMA Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero, make manifest. Thank you.